Blunt, as Dr. Wenger introduced me, I'm Hannah Brumbaugh, and today I will be doing a presentation on radical feminism, voices of different centuries. I will be going over two specific people who cover a large gap of time, um, but I hope today that I can tie it all in together for you and show you the comparisons between the two. So, a call to action to reorder the societal standards set up by patriarchy, an ideology that exposes marginalization, oppression, and imprisonment of all genders. Radical feminism is more than the stereotypical bra burnings, marches, and male hatred. The beginning of this ideology was rooted in the fight to dethrone men and enforce a class hatred within genders. Over time, radical feminism has developed, however, and it now defines itself as a fight for equity. With the belief that when women are liberated from their oppression, then the men can be liberated from their imprisonment of toxic masculinity. Early radical feminists argued against injustice toward women, attacking the confinement that a woman had to the home and the constant questioning of a woman's intelligence. These arguments against patriarchy began in forms of literature, where women contended their inability to write and formulate arguments and provide solutions for society. Women were fighting to have the same rights that men were born with. In the introduction of my paper, I referenced modern radical feminism explaining that, quote, people who attribute themselves as radical feminists do not oppose men. They oppose the patriarchy and the oppression of all people. Although this perspective began as a fight for equality of women, a radical feminist can call attention to the oppression through a number of means. However, the actions that cause the most impact are through literature, entertainment, and media. So much like Misty, I'm also following in the world of Fanny Fern. Sarah Willis Parker, known better under her pseudonym Fanny Fern, was one of the first radical feminists to make a statement with her writing, and she really paved a path for other women during her century and beyond. She used journal, journal articles and a local paper to point out the obstacles that women experience. She wrote an article called Aunt Hetty on Matrimony, where Fern encouraged young girls to stay single and referred to marriages as, quote, the hardest way on earth to earn a living because you never quite know when your work is done. Fern referenced the tireless effort that women were expected to put in for keeping a home well, meaning that they were cleaning, looking after the children, and attending to their husbands. Aunt Hetty condemns men for characterizing women as in-home labor, and refers to husbands as tyrannical traitors. She wittily calls them domestic Napoleons. <laughs> in my paper, I explore why the reference to Napoleon Bonaparte is so important. I argue that, quote, men during the stage of dating act different. Men promised young girls a good life, telling their girlfriends they would be appreciated and respected. But soon after marriage, they become a traitor and they fall victim to society's limitations on women. The husband begins to shut down the freedoms and independent thought of their new wives because men now become the head of that household. Aunt Hetty argues that husbands are selfish and they treat their wives like children, talking down to them and to enforce their own dominance. Like Napoleon, husbands see the world through a lens, a lens that forces these men to seek respect from high levels of dominance and economic success, even if it means becoming a traitor to their own wife. A, success, a man's success is defined also by marrying a good woman during this time, who can tend to the home successfully. This causes men to fall victim to the internalized misogyny as well, because they're imprisoning their wives in the home and giving them feminine duties keep the appearance of masculinity within society. If men would have liberated women from the home imprisonment during Fern's time, they would have been liberated from toxic masculinity earlier, allowing them to not carry the weight of the family, society's expectations, and the financial crisis on their own. Fern graciously took a daunting task of fighting against marginalization to save men and women from being categorized and creating more confinements for the future generations. Fern's hard work paid off. Her literary fight against the patriarchy resulted in future generations' ability to speak out more freely. Women in the 21st century are now provided with more freedoms, rights, and opportunities, thanks to radical feminists like Fern, who went against the grain of society. Although her hard work paid off and women have gained respect, alongside men for the most part, that does not mean misogyny has ended completely. A society has changed over time, and so has the limitations and the expectations of women and men. Modern society looks at women as a homemaker, but as a sexual object. 
and beauty and sex appeal now define the value that women have within society. Amy Schumer, a comedian that many know and some love, some do not, is the modern day embodiment of Fanny Fern. These two women are fighting similar battles in similar ways for the same end goal, the liberation of women and men from societal imprisonment. Schumer, like Fern, uses entertainment, humor to be exact, specific to her time period, to grab the attention of society and point out the oppressive ridicule that women face. Inside Amy Schumer is a television show that Schumer created to reach more of a broad audience. One episode of her show that sticks out to me as a, represent as a representation of women's marginalization is when Schumer uses the plot of the famous movie 12 Angry Men. The episode follows 12 men who are trying to decide if Schumer is attractive enough to appear on television. The question is asked in the episode, does she strike a reasonable chub? The men immediately hint at, arous at arousal, questioning Schumer's worth on television based on visual appearance and sex appeal. The men point out the issues they see within Schumer by referencing her body as being built like a lineman. They even go further to attack her waistline, asking how she got so big with a mouth that small. In my paper, I argue that, quote, the men in the episode reference her build as masculine rather than a dainty female. Having the build of a lineman means broad shoulders, muscle, and a larger body size. Leading back to the original question regarding her mouth and her bodily appearance. Men in this episode degrade her body build to further establish their own masculinity. They view her as a sex symbol and disregard her intelligence and skill. Schumer has portrayed the men as representations of society, proving men and women are imprisoned by, so by societal construct and internalized sexism. Society expects women to be curvaceous with small waists, tan skin, etc. Women and men are programmed to internalize misogyny and seek the ideal look when in fact all looks are ideal." End quote. Fern and Schumer both have been referred to as scandalous and vulgar for their radical voices. Fern has been ridiculed for her multiple marriages, her journal articles, and the fight against marriage and for female independence, and also her disregard for society's construct. Schumer's voice uses modern methods of entertainment, and she is ridiculed for her vulgar language and content and lack of attractiveness. Schumer, at the Gloria Awards and Gala, a ceremony to salute women of a vision, gave a speech about the confidence that women should always feel. And Schumer told the audience, quote, I am a woman with thoughts and questions and shit to say. I say if I'm beautiful. I say if I'm strong. You will not determine my story. I will. I will speak and share and fuck and love, and I will never apologize to the frightened millions who resent that they never had it in them to do it. I stand here and I am amazing for you, not because of you. I am not who I sleep with. I am not my weight. I am not my mother. I am myself and I am all of you. And thank you." End quote. My paper analyzes this quote from Schumer's speech and dissects the intricacies of what she says and what her words really mean. My paper argues that, quote, Schumer reminds women that nobody can define who they are by language, sexuality, or oppression. Others will not determine her story. And like Fanny Fern, Schumer pushes women to step outside the boxes that they have been imprisoned in. Schumer pleads to her fellow women to take control of the confidence and pride they have in themselves and to do it unapologetically. She wants them to look in the mirror and believe that they are beautiful women and know that they are and acknowledge they cannot be defined by who they sleep with, love, or who they are the child of. She, like Fern, wants them to fight back against men, women, anyone who oppresses the individuality and beauty that comes from within. Schumer reminds women in the audience that they are who they want to be and not what society makes them. Schumer also uses vulgar language to grab the attention of the audience. She is labeled as a vulgar woman, so she uses her label to fight against those who condemn her. This is what makes her, and Fern radical. Schumer knows that society criticizes her for vulgarity, and just as Fern did, Schumer uses her indictments as ammunition against the oppressive nature that modern culture thrives in. She replicates Fern's fight, bringing an eye for an eye, seeking to reorder the societal standards for men and women. Although Fern and Schumer fought for the liberation of women, they did it for different outcomes, but in similar ways. During my time at Shepherd, I have been introduced to a number of feminist pieces, 
where I've been given the opportunity to understand the limitations and expectations that women and men are trained to excel with. Feminist Manifesto by Mina Loy was my first introduction to radical feminism. It ignited my passion, and when Dr. Hanrahan introduced my peers and I to Fanny Fern, I knew that my identity as a woman would forever be changing, but in a powerful way. Questions and comments? Yes. Uh, you mentioned a uh, test in the first part of uh, the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like uh, like quite fast in ecology, the ecology that we have currently, do you feel like it makes matters first? Absolutely. So because of class and also because of race, um, there's this layered type of oppression that exists, especially, especially, especially within women. Because you see that white women are less oppressed than black women or by Latinx women. Um, there's just this constant layering, and it definitely plays a role based on their socioeconomic status. Um, women who have more money, regardless of how they look, are going to be higher on the list. And there is no true layer of who will be oppressed more unless you do have the kind of funds to where you can appear that you are higher and better off. So yeah, absolutely. Class, pay, class plays a large role into it. So my question is, you've done, you've done a nice job connecting Fern and Schumer, uh, but what made you first think of Schumer and kind of where the inspiration was? And this is a second part of that question. Um, why do you think it's so important to be connecting these older works with these sort of newer feminist women who um, are these modern representations, as you say, of some of the same kinds of struggles and desires and quests so I was really interested with Fanny Fern when Dr. Hanrahan introduced me to her. And I spent some time with Dr. Hanrahan working on the paper that I had written for her class. And I was trying to figure out a connection that I could make with Fern. And I found it really interesting because I, at the time, I was really into Amy Schumer. Inside Amy Schumer had just really come out as a television show. And I really enjoyed watching it. And I, as a woman, didn't really understand why I liked it so much. I was like, man, this woman's cool. She's vulgar. Like, yeah. And it was fun. And I. I sat and I really thought about it, and I was like, you know, it's interesting how over time you can look and see that women are still oppressed, but just in different ways. We may not be seen as a stereotypical housewife anymore, but that joke a few years ago was still there that the woman should be in the kitchen making a sandwich. And then Schumer pops in and she's saying, you know, I'm beautiful, I'm who I am, do not define me because who I sleep with. And in the speech that I reference, her speech is actually a story of when she's in college. Um, and she has this one night stand with this guy that she really, really liked. And that was when she realized pinnacly that she was in fact just a sexual object to men. And so I compared this oppression and marginalization that women have experienced over time. And since it is such a large gap, I wanted to take two very powerful voices and bring them together to show that as society has progressed, so has oppression um, in positive and negative ways. Another question. So I'm curious, I was going to ask, are there many other um, women like Schumer today who are maybe not doing like the exact same thing, but kind of like her, that are also speaking like maybe not as intense as she does, because I know she's pretty, she's pretty intense, but you know, maybe along the same lines. Well, if you look in terms of comedy, you have Sarah Silverman, who uh, was kind of first in terms of what Schumer has kind of jumped onto and followed. And I would say that really anywhere within media, if you see a woman who has a strong voice and she's talking about who she is and the confidence and support of other women, I think they exist all around us. The stand up here and point out names for people who I think all of us as women and men should look to, I think is a little difficult. Um, because if you look at the progression of society, you'll find men and women both who have stepped into this role. It just so happens that I've picked two females to compare, but I think that I could definitely pick a male who fights for feminist rights as well. Yes? One of the cool things I like that Amy Schumer does too is uses her like relatively high profile mm -hmm. to, to direct attention to other women in comedy who might be doing. Like I, one of the, Ways I found uh, two of my favorite comedians, uh, Rachel Feinstein and um, Nikki Glaser, was through a special called Women Who Kill that had Amy Schumer as well. It was produced by her. And so like, it seems like, like she, she's definitely supporting other people who are doing similar things too and, and pointing them in their direction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And she's written two books now. Um, 
she is coming out with a brand new movie here in a few months. She's already starred in a few, and she's using every means of Hollywood to really set an example um, for people to look at and to find that liberation. And I would definitely agree. Yes. A hard question, but um, I'm wondering <clears throat> um, uh, within the uh, um, the ideology that you're representing. What would be actually an intimate, uh, healthy relationship uh, based on a lifetime commitment? Wow. You know what, Dr. Lewis? You can get in or out of marriage, but I'm just wondering, what would it look like and how would it, how would would it, how would it manifest? I would say it's respect. Um, if you have a woman or a man that wants to be a housewife or a stay-at-home dad, let them do it. If you have two people that want to have career lives but also have children, let them do it. I think in order to have the proper marriage and to be respectful of both genders and what they want to be, um, since gender is a fluid concept, then let people do what they want to do, support them and love them. And I think that that's how you have a successful marriage. When marriages fail is when people step into these type of imprisonments and they say that because you're this, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And that causes the problem. Thank you, Hannah. Mm -hmm.